It's been a turbulent couple of months for the Academy football teams. When the Big Ten and Pac-12 postponed their seasons, the ripple effects forced Army and Navy to scramble to assemble a schedule. You know, we've been planning for this day for so long. So many plans got thrown in the trash. Things got changed. We weren't really sure what you were going to do. Meanwhile, the Air Force Falcons are relegated to just two games this season, but will challenge their academy brethren to the coveted Commander-in-Chief's trophy. It's, uh, it's certainly going to be a different game. It's not going to look the same. It's not going to feel the same, but we're going to have an opportunity to play Navy, and that's really important for the young men in our football program. It's been a season of fast starts, rocky debuts, and historic comebacks. That's Military Academy football, and there's only one place to hear all about it. Welcome to Behind the Lines, the Academy Football Report. Get your flak jackets on and your combat helmets ready because there is shrapnel flying all over the football field. Hello and thanks for joining us on our inaugural show of Behind the Lines, the Academy Football Report. You can say what you want about this season of Academy football. It certainly isn't the season anyone envisioned. The potholes have been many starting with Army and Navy, who had to assemble schedules when upwards of 80% of their opponents canceled games because of the pandemic. But the schedules have been filled for both those teams, and it's full steam ahead. Unfortunately for the Bears of the Coast Guard Academy, 2020 will be mostly a lost season. But don't give up hope on the Secretary's Cup. We'll have more on that shortly. Meanwhile, I'm joined by Diane Roberts, who's covering the Air Force Falcons. John Media Perel, who's covering Navy, and Aaron Summers, who's covering the Army Black Knights. Diane, let's start with you. What's the recon report say about the Falcons? Well, Graham, let's start with schedule, shall we? I mean, everyone's looking forward to this weekend where they're hosting Navy. The Falcons want to exact a little revenge for last year's loss. Coming up November 7th, they're going to play Army. And of course, they hope it all culminates in retaining the Commander-in-Chief trophy. Now, what about the bigger picture of the schedule? We just learned last week, late last week, that the Pac-12, the Mountain West, following the lead of other conferences and have decided to play. Not sure how that's going to affect the Falcons schedule. But we'll know more next weekend, and we hope you'll join us right back here where we'll give you an update a little bit later in this show. I'll have the story of how they exactly won the Commander-in-Chief trophy. We'll talk about how COVID-19 impacted their preparation, and we'll get a sneak peek at some new uniforms that you'll see week one, but you'll see it here first. Now, quick look with my colleague John Mitaparel, who's covering the Navy Midshipmen. Thanks, Diane. The midshipmen are ready to charge into October after a dramatic come-from-behind win over Tulane. Navy kicks it off October 3rd with a game against Air Force, followed by a home date against Temple on the 10th, a visit to East Carolina on the 17th, another home game against Houston on the 24th, and then a trip to Dallas to take on SMU October 31st. The Air Force game should tell a huge story that has the potential to be a great one. But first, we're going to throw it down to Army and get the latest on the Black Knights from Aaron Summers. Aaron, take it away. Thanks, John. On November 19th, 2019, Army released their 2020 football schedule. By August 10th, that schedule had shrunk down to just three games. Athletic Director Mike Buddy worked hard to line up opponents on the fly as the Black Knights readied for the unknown. On September 5th, Army welcomed Middle Tennessee State to Mikey Stadium, and the Black Knights came out firing on all cylinders. I don't know if the opening game could have gone any better. I, I think it's probably the most complete game we've played as a team since I've been here as the coach. Offensively, the Knights scored a touchdown on every single drive, amassing 368 total yards, 340 coming on the ground. My offensive line did did a lot of that work, but you know, also, and you know, we had our, our receivers, our slots. I think it was a, it was a team effort, and I, all I had to do was just, you know, take a couple steps and go in the end zone. Sandon McCoy had a banner day, tying a career high with three rushing touchdowns. Defensively, the Knights held the Blue Raiders to 184 total yards, forced four turnovers, and West Point found the end zone off three of them. An impressive opening under new defensive coordinator Nate Woody. We didn't really have any challenges. Um, you know, the way our guys, the way our whole defense just attacked the preparation and the install, 
And yeah, we didn't have a spring practice, but um, the time that we did have, we made the most of it. The defense made a statement, shutting out Middle Tennessee State 42-0. to zero. The cadets continued to roll in week two against Louisiana Monroe, responding well to a shaky second quarter that saw the Knights fumble and give up their first touchdown of the season. Encouraged by just the, the attitude of our guys in the second half. A lot to be encouraged about, as the Knights mowed the Warhawks down, rushing for 436 yards, 12 players carry the rock as new stars emerged. As Coach VD always harps on staying ready, you know, doing your job when the number's called, and really just learning from the guys like in front of you. So you know, I learned so much from Sandin and Kay while they play. Uh, great to see him have a, have a day like that. And, uh, and there's, there's, a, there's a good bunch of guys there, obviously, with Sandin and, and Cade being veterans. And we saw Anthony last week made a great run to, to score a touchdown for us and Jacoby today, so that's, uh, that's encouraging. The Knights held their ground, forcing six three and outs and holding Louisiana Monroe to just 37 rushing yards. They're, they're playing really, really hard and um, just couldn't be more pleased with the effort that they're playing with, how physical, getting two more turnovers today. In week three, Army was forced to pump the brakes as BYU had to postpone their matchup due to a number of positive COVID-19 tests. All eyes turned to the number 22 ranked Black Knights matchup at number 14, Cincinnati. I don't know if we could be uh, put into a, a more exciting position in week three, or I guess this is week four in our third game, than to play a, a team of, of Cincinnati's caliber. It's an opportunity for us to test ourselves against one of the best teams in college football. The first true test, an Army fired first, with the 41-yard fumble recovery by Jabari Moore returned for a touchdown. However, it would be the only time the Knights were able to find the end zone for the rest of the game. We, we were just shooting ourselves in the foot with penalties and turnovers. Um, if, if we have those, we're not, we're not going to be very su successful on offense. After averaging 388 rushing yards through the first two games, Army was held to 182 yards on the ground. The Black Knights committed 10 penalties and had a pump blocked. Well, our guys played their butts off. They played really, really hard. And we played the number 14 team in the country who's very physical and a very good football team. And they beat us today. They were a better football team today. But I'm certainly not panicking. I mean, I, I don't. There's nothing wrong with our football team. You know, they beat us. It hurts to lose, so it makes you, you know, just rise to the occasion, and that's what we'll do next week. We're going to come back out here. We're going to have an immense great day tomorrow practicing and watching film and attacking in the weight room. This week, the cadets are back home, welcoming FCS member Abilene Christian for their first matchup ever. The Wildcats are 0-1 after falling to El Paso 17-13 on September 19th. While ACU struggled at times last season, finishing six in the Southland with a five and seven record, they boasted the best run defense in the conference, allowing just under 100 yards per game. Army is built on their rushing attack, a focus for the Knights against Abilene Christian. What we're able to have success here is by running the football and controlling the clock and trying to keep the ball away from the other team. The Abilene Christian at Army game kicks off at 1.30 on Saturday. The Black Knights are a 30-point favorite in that one. Now, let's get a behind-the-lines preview of the Navy at Air Force game. Diane, what can you tell us about the Falcons? Thanks so much, Aaron. You know, as we've already noted, this is not a normal year at all for anyone, including college football, thanks to the coronavirus. Unlike the rest of the NCAA, though, the military academies had a unique opportunity to play this year. A shortened season, to be sure, but they were going to play nonetheless. So how is Air Force's week one shaping up? Well, we're going to look ahead by starting with a look back. And the Falcons go 6-0 at home. School win number 400 at Air Force with their 10th win of the year as they down the Cowboys. And with that 20-6 win over Wyoming to end the 2019 season, the Falcons set the stage for the 2020 campaign, not knowing what was ahead in the form of an opponent they never saw coming, the coronavirus. I can't think of a medical scenario that, that comes anywhere close to what we're dealing with right now. Student athletes have the expertise of public health and other medical experts on base, in addition to the athletic medical staff to help sort it all out. 
The staff is grateful for military structure and the inherent discipline it provides. And that's been helpful in that we can uh, use both our, our medical recommendation but also have the athletic department leadership and coaching leadership use the military model of, of following directives and commands. Well, I think one thing that we certainly understand and come to appreciate in sport is that adversity and stress can certainly build you up and make you stronger. Since the service academies have a similar makeup with cadets on campus, same testing protocols, and their bases secluded from the general public, a shortened season just between them became reality. It's, uh, it's certainly going to be a different game. It's not going to look the same. It's not going to feel the same but we're going to have an opportunity to play Navy, and that's really important for the young men in our football program. One difference? Some players, thinking there would not be fall football, took what's called a turn back, the opportunity to skip the fall semester or a whole year because of personal issue or hardship. Another difference will be cadets only in the stadium, no other fans. It was a difficult decision. We certainly know that we'd have a packed stadium if uh, COVID wasn't uh, part of the, the factor in. So, um, yeah, unfortunate certainly for our fans that uh, we would have loved to have had everybody in there, but that's just not the reality of where we are today. Not an easy task. Unbalanced line left. Hand up. Touchdown, Air Force. Through the 2019 season, Air Force has more commander in chief trophies than the other service academies with 20. This week's opponent, Navy, has the second most with 16. And the Falcons don't want them to get any closer. And Sanders is tackled. Ball comes loose. It's going to be picked up by Navy at the eight yard line. And they're going to run it in for a touchdown. And the midshipmen come streaming onto the field as the ball game ends. The sting of last year's loss to the midshipmen is still there. This is a big season for head coach Troy Calhoun. He's just two away from 100 wins. The Falcons hope to give him that honor. They closed the 2019 season with an eight-game winning streak by beating Washington State 31-21 in the Cheez-It Bowl, the program's longest streak since 1998. So now the plan is for the Falcons to make 2020 another historic season coronavirus aside, and it starts with a win against Navy. John, what about the Navy team? They got off to a rough start, but what a turnaround. Yeah, that's right, Diane. It was a forgettable night for Navy, their first game against BYU in 31 years, and they started poorly, trailing 31 to nothing at halftime. Well, we look like that was our first live game, and unfortunately, you know, normally uh, your live stuff is against yourselves. But there's nobody to blame but myself. I mean, we knew that. I uh, I erred on the side of trying to keep our guys safe with COVID-19 and contact tracing stuff. But um, we weren't ready to play. Obviously, it's the worst Navy football game we've ever played. But we weren't prepared. BYU wins it 55-3, to and it's on to Tulane for Navy. And that one started slowly as well, with Tulane grabbing a 24 to nothing lead at the half. Like I said, that first half looked just like the BYU game. We couldn't, we couldn't get a first down. We couldn't stop them. I mean, it was as bad as the BYU game. Navy's Cameron Kinley had an interception in his own goal line, and that turned the momentum for the midshipmen. Yeah, you know, just like Coach Ken said, there was no special formula. Um, there was no halftime speech that really sparked it. It was really just... Um, you know, my brothers rising up with something, there was something that ri rose up within them and just, you know, taking it one play at a time. They did their job. That's basically what happened. We, we kept telling each other, hey, zero, zero, do your job, do your job. And we just kept emphasizing that and, and, it, and it worked out in our favor. Quarterback Dalen Morris guided the revitalized offense with 139 yards passing and a score. Nelson Smith added two touchdowns rushing and Jamal Carruthers added more than 100 yards on the ground. Linebacker Diego Fago will be important against Air Force offense. He won the AAC Defensive Player of the Week against Tulane with nine tackles and a sack. The Falcons were 11-2 last year. It is their season opener. They're led by tailback Caden Remsburg. He's coming off a 1,000-yard season, and their quarterback, Donald Hammond, threw for over 1,300 yards and three touchdowns. The defense returns leading tackler Demonte Meeks. Thank you, Diane, John, and Aaron for those recon reports. 
When Behind the Lines returns, we'll sit down with the head coach of the Coast Guard Bears and discuss his off-again, on-again season. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Behind the Lines. I'm Graham Knight. Imagine, if you will, that after working 21 years on both sides, both the offensive and the defensive side of the line, that you finally get the head coach position. Now imagine that it's March 2020. Please help me welcome to the show Coach C.C. Grant from the Coast Guard Bears. Coach, welcome to the show. Hey, no problem. Good to be here. Coach, let's start with the big headline. Just out this week is news that the Secretary's Cup will be played. Yeah, uh, it's been a couple weeks in the work. Um, I got notified about two weeks ago uh, that there's a possibility that the game could take place. Um, we kind of zeroed in on a date. Uh, I like the idea of keeping it the original date, um, which we were able to work that out. Um, work out some details as far as this whole COVID testing and that type of protocols go. And uh, on Monday, the, the superintendent, uh, Admiral Kelly, came down and let the team know that uh, that we're gonna we're, we're full go for this thing. So I'm quite excited, especially for our seniors. So it's March, and you're head coach. When did you realize COVID was going to interrupt your season? Uh, well, actually, the pandemic was already here, believe it or not. Um, so when I got the news, uh, I was happy. But you know, as any coaches, I'm thinking, you know, my guys are all away from the academy. And it was kind of a weird, I guess, a kind of weird transition um, because, you know, we didn't have spring ball. Um, they weren't here. And I didn't get to see the kids basically all summer. Um, and the first, matter of fact, the first uh, team, uh, any type of meeting we had was online, as everything is uh, these days. So um, it's been different, um, you know, to take over your first year and say, hey, you got to handle this pandemic. Um, you're not going to have any football games. Um, how are you going to handle it? It's, uh, you know, I don't know because of, there's no, this, this is a different playbook uh, than anything that anybody's ever had to, had to deal with. So, Coach, I'd be remiss if I didn't touch on the elephant in the room. Not only are we in the middle of a pandemic, but we're also in the middle of a social reckoning. What's it like to be the one of only a handful of black collegiate coaches? Well, I think um, my thoughts are uh, I was the first African-American baseball coach at the academy. Um, I need to carry myself in such a way that uh, not only my players, but other people on campus see me uh, as a leader um, and that, that the respect that I've gained since I've been there, um, that's going to go before me, all right? How I carry myself, uh, how I want players to carry myself so there will be others after me. I understand that in, in, in this country today that there are people who have gone before me who have opened doors, who have paved the way for me. And I know that it's my job to kind of pick up the torch and carry it and that I'm given this great opportunity. So, you know, I, 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 yes, I'm an African-American man uh, and, and a great job. Um, but, I, I, you know, I, I don't always look at myself that way. I kind of see myself as just a person doing a, doing, doing a job. But I understand uh, the burden that I carry. All right, let's take it back to football. Talk to me a little bit about the Secretary's Cup. My, my, my big thing right now is make sure our kids are – are physically fit, make sure, you know, we're getting them strong as they can possibly be. Uh, and we'll, we'll, turn our, we'll turn our eyes to the X and O's as we approach the game uh, to make sure we're, we're, we're ready in all facets of the game. Well, I have no doubt you'll be prepared for it. Coach, thanks for making time for us. Really appreciate you uh, taking the effort, and we wish you well in the Secretary's Cup. It's great to see you. It'll be great to see you guys play this season. Hey, well, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Graham. When we come back, we'll take a look at some Academy football history. Stay with us. We'll be right back. It is a fact that uh, back in World War II, we had an all-Negro fighter group that I commanded. One of my German friends he used to say when he saw us coming, he saw it with red tail. And he would call over the radio, here come the blackbirds, let's get the hell out of here. We were, wanted to be treated as men. That's it. That was our objective. And to make sure that we received the opportunity to perform at the level that we felt good. When I went to flying school, people said, what are you going to do if you fail to make it? And I said, I didn't come here to fail. 
One final pregame note before the Middies and the Falcons kick off. Air Force will sport new commemorative uniforms for the game, honoring the legendary 350-member Tuskegee Airmen, the all-African American pilots and crew known as the Red Tails. The helmets will feature the P-51 aircraft flown by the four fighter squadrons from World War II. Air Force versus Navy, October 1, 2011. A cool autumn afternoon in Annapolis, Maryland, with the Secretary of Defense in attendance. The visiting Falcons took an 18-point lead early in the fourth quarter, but the midshipmen rallied to tie the game with 19 seconds left, and the game went into overtime at 28 apiece. In overtime, Navy scored first on a touchdown, but the extra point was blocked, keeping the score at 34-28 Navy. The Falcons answered with a touchdown of their own and by the slimmest of margins, an extra point went on to defeat Navy in overtime 35-34. And the Falcons went on to retain the Commander-in-Chief's trophy for 2011. Welcome back to the inaugural episode of Behind the Lines. As we wrap up this first show, I want to let you all know that Behind the Lines has a community give back. Early in my career, I used to transport America's sick and injured veterans to and from their appointments. Later in my career, I worked as a contractor for the Department of Energy. And during my time there, I worked with VA facilities around the country, helping them to save energy so that they could use that energy savings to pay for building retrofits. Over the past decade or so, I've been troubled with the struggles of America's vets. And we're going to dedicate 20% of our net profits to helping homeless veterans. When you join us next week, we'll have the highlights from the Air Force versus Navy game. And we'll also have the highlights from Army versus ACU. Join us next week for all the reconnaissance on those games and much, much more. Thanks again for watching. I'm Graham Knight. We hope to see you next time.